This is Tom Koslick, the head of strategy and credit at Hilltop Securities. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the municipal bond market with Eric Kazansky. Eric is Bloomberg Intelligence's head of municipal strategy. And in that role, he's responsible for creating municipal focus research for uh, Bloomberg terminal clients. Eric has 20 years of successful experience in municipal bonds. Prior to working at Bloomberg, he was a institutional desk strategist at Jenny Montgomery Scott in Philadelphia, and also a municipal portfolio manager at SEI Investments. So welcome, Eric. It's good to have you today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And Eric and I are going to discuss a few topics. The first thing is the supply and demand dynamic, which is oftentimes a very important influential factor in municipals. Uh, the future of COVID, we're testing new cases and hospitalizations and uh, vaccinations are. We're going to discuss the $350 billion portion of the state and local government that President Biden introduced in the middle of January, and then discuss a topic that before the tax code of 2017 was discussed once in a while, but the threat to the tax exemption is something that as the federal government begins to spend or has spent you know, trillions on COVID relief. It's something that could emerge, especially before the midterm elections, as something that's important. And so, Eric, we we saw another $2.6 billion flow into municipal funds this week. And there's been about, over the last eight weeks, an average of $2 billion that's flown into municipals. That being said, January issuance was just below average at about $24 billion. I was wondering what your take about the supply and demand dynamic is right now in municipals. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, year over year, we're down 12%. Um, so I think by far and large, everyone came into 2021, thought it was going to be this lights out, big issuance year, um, a lot of tailwinds for the sector. Um, you know, pent-up demand, sort of enticing a lot of issuers to come to market, combined with low rates, um, you know, sort of a big rush into the taxable sector as well. But I, I think you had a couple things happen at the beginning of the year that have really sort of thrown that off track, at least temporarily. Um, you, you had uh, the events of January 6th, um, then you sort of had um, probably a little bit of wait and see with some tail risk just to make sure that the inauguration actually happened on the 20th. And, you know, now you sort of have two big things lurking in the distance, one year, one a little bit further, that could really impact um, the borrowing rates and the borrowing amounts and subsidies for issuers going forward, one being the stimulus package, two being an infrastructure package that um, obviously is, is still sort of amorphous right now, but it's lurking out there. So if I'm a borrower and I have these big capital projects that I'm considering and you know, it's a difference between issuing now and potentially losing out on some federal matching funds if I wait six, seven, eight months. I might just put that off. So I think both of those are creating a little bit of a, a drag on issuance right now. And what about demand? Demand is very, very strong. Um, look, I mean, we can sort of point back to, you know, ICI and upper fund flows over the last year. Um, with the exception of a couple of weeks in March, I mean, had that not happened, that sort of really small in the grand scheme of things period of um, sort of, uh, let's call it illiquidity in the market, uh, we probably would have had almost two years of consistent inflows into the space. I think some things just don't really change for media investors. One is really sort of this uh, lurking fear of higher taxes, which if you sort of think about all the things we're gonna be spending money on and the amounts that are going to be spent, eventually a bill will come due and eventually taxes will rise. So that. Is certainly something that they, they have in mind and it's legitimate. Um, and two is really sort of that probably like that mindset of the muni investor that they will spend whatever amount necessary to avoid paying taxes, really, that hatred of taxes, that avoidance of taxes knows no bound. And we're seeing that right now um, as we've hit record low ratios, translating to record high muni valuations, and it really hasn't put any sort of breaks on the amount of money coming into the space. So um, to answer your question, it's been very strong. Yeah, yeah, it really has. I mean, like, as I mentioned, just over the, the last uh, couple of weeks, we've averaged $2 billion a week. I mean, that is an extraordinary amount of money 
coming into the municipal market. Uh, and the the lands the COVID landscape seems to have improved since the beginning of January. Yeah. The number of the number of hospitalizations, the number of new cases on a daily basis, the the number of we saw a record a record amount of deaths in December, and then another record amount in January. Uh, but the number of new cases and hospitalizations is starting to fall. Uh, what is your take on what? we're seeing related to those numbers? Obviously, it's a good thing. Um, you, you never want to see those curves continue to go parabolic. Um, and you know, sort of taking our cues from, from the UK and, and you know, larger Europe, I mean, we, we knew that they had a peak prior to us, and you know, they're on the downside, and then we're starting to see that same impact week later. Um, look, we're, we're now well over a month beyond uh, the Christmas holiday. Um, so all, all sorts of non-social distancing that was going on and transmission of cases is sort of working its way through the system. That combined with vaccination efforts, which are, you know, the numbers are, are growing each day, is are sort of two positives um, that are, you know, obviously like helping those caseloads go down. Look, I think, I think the threat for municipals when it relates to COVID isn't so, so much like sort of what the threats were back last April and March when we sort of didn't really understand what was going on, right? It was sort of like this sort of blindfold on feeling our way around. I think really the, the risks now are a, a continued delayed um, economic recovery um, sort of combined with any sort of spike in varying cases that no one is really sort of banking on meaningfully at this point. I think that there are some medical professionals that I've seen who are, who are talking about it, but um, CDC guidelines certainly seem to intimate that there's a comfort level, at least for those who are vaccinated, that there no longer needs to be a quarantine period after close contact with someone who, who, who is infected with COVID, right? So I, I think that they're putting a lot of stock and comfort in the fact that once they get a large majority of the population vaccinated, um, that things can return to some sort of normalcy. And so right now it seems to be uh, a race to vaccinate the population. And one of the things that I've been paying a, a lot of attention to over the last two weeks is what the potential for, the, what the potential rate of spread could be with the new variants. You know, that's something that uh, going back over, you know, maybe seven to 10 days ago, it, it seemed to be getting a little more attention. It doesn't really seem to be getting a lot of attention, you know, what the potential of uh, the additional spread from those variants could be to the point where there was, was one uh, health official who projected that we could see spikes even higher than what we saw in January uh, in a time period that would now be about five to 13 weeks from now. Do you think that that is going to uh, set state and local governments back if that happens? I mean, of course it could, but you could also go the other way and none of that could happen. And we head into a warmer weather period and we have some sort of seasonality to do lower caseloads like we saw last year, right? So it could really go either way. I think for people investing in the municipal space, it's really sort of keeping abreast of, you know, how things have recovered to date, especially in sectors that are really dependent on non-social distancing, right? Because those are really the things that really sort of felt the biggest investor um, pushback over the last year. And, and while that has reverted over the last couple of months, sort of amid this like cash flow into the sector, um, credit risks are still there. Um, we're talking about bonds for student housing, for stadiums, for airports, um, and things of that nature, where it involves a congregation of people, you know, uh, that we really haven't had meaningfully in a long time. Um, and, I, and I think some investors have realized that there's probably additional value in this space because they saw a recovery um, you know, in the distance and they wanted to sort of ride that wave, which I, I think was very prescient. Um, you know, for me though, I think just sort of looking at how things are progressing though, there's still a lot of unanswered questions that, that I have that doesn't seem to have crystallized as far as any answers yet. Um, especially, mm -hmm. you know, when you sort of look in the airport space, um, you know, obviously we went into the, the pandemic and a lot of the airports had decent cash cushions and that was able to combine with federal stimulus, you know, sort of ride them through the storm. But 
I think another factor to keep in mind is you really have this sort of split when it comes to travel between, you know, regular everyday families going on vacation for leisure and business travel. And I think with work from home persisting, no one can really say with any sort of certainty what the status of business travel and convention centers um, traffic is going to look like in, in sort of a world with a new normal, right? Look, I can only speak from my company's experience, and I'm sure we saved a ton of money on travel to go see clients. Um, and I think, you know, we you know, were very successful in implementing, you know, technology and, and meeting with people virtually and sort of keeping everything moving forward. And I'm sure a lot of companies feel the same way, and they enjoyed those savings. It'll be interesting to see how quickly um, business travel picks up again um, to, you know, what extent it compares to where levels were before. And I think a lot of that's sort of going to drive the valuations on some of these sectors going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because as I have uh, looked at and examined uh, emplainments or vehicle miles traveled after uh, 2000, after 9-11 and 2001 and or after the Great Recession, uh, especially after the Great Recession, it took in the case of vehicle miles traveled and emplainments, uh, not just months, but years for those numbers mm -hmm. to return to the pre-2008 levels. Yeah. Look, there's pent-up demand for and travel. That, I mean, if you look at the busiest airports in the world right now, one of the busiest routes is Miami to San Juan. So, you know, obviously, like, there, there's restrictions when it comes to international travel, but just from a domestic basis, I mean, there's people who want to get away and out of their house and their kids are virtual learning. And, you know, they're like, hey, we're going to go someplace warm. Um, so I, I do think that there is definitely something there to build up pent-up demand. I just don't know where that split shakes out as far as business versus leisure, um, you know, sort of as we, we get tests. It's like, you know, large proportion of the population vaccinated slash herd immunity status. Well, on top of that as well, one of the things that uh, I know that we both saw yesterday was that it seems as though the White House is considering uh, potential travel restrictions in order to control the potential spread of the new variants. So, um, I did see that. I did see uh, that. And then, look, obviously, yeah. like the, the the initial intimation is that it's going to re-impact the areas that are just sort of starting to come out of their their shell right. um, that are heavily dependent on tourism, like the Vegas, the Orlando areas, Miami. So it's it's really really unfortunate. However, I, I think the Biden administration, as far as the framework they have in place for what they want, you know, the next round of stimulus to look like. Um, at least it has something on its mind as opposed to just sort of throwing money into the wind. They want to direct about 169 of that 195 billion that's going to states to those most impacted by job losses. And those are going to go to the states that have the higher unemployment rates that have economies that are more heavily slanted toward hospitality, tourism, travel, and service. So I do think that it's good that help is on the way. Um, it probably can't come soon enough for a lot of people. That's a great segue into talking about that $1.9 trillion first stage uh, package that President Biden uh, proposed just before he was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the numbers that you were citing, correct me if I'm wrong, were the numbers that were released towards the middle of this week. Uh, and there are still, they're still estimates at this point, uh, but I think it probably gives us a, a decent taste of what it is or a decent look at what it is that state governments and local governments could be um, receiving as, as part of that $350 billion of unencumbered direct aid. And I think it's important to note that this $350 billion would be unencumbered direct aid because while there was $150 billion of aid for state and local governments in the CARES Act, that could only, that, that, those funds could only be used for specific COVID uses. It couldn't be used for uh, budget shortfalls and, 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 and other things. And mm -hmm. there, has been, then there has been some other uh, funding for schools and, and other sectors, but this would be, you know, almost a year later, this would be the first time there there could be direct unencumbered aid for state and local governments. One of the things that I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about is whether, first of all, it's 
needed. I was wondering what your thoughts are about that, if it's needed across the country, and and or depending on what your answer is there, uh, is it enough? I mean, is it needed? Probably. Um, is it enough? It depends on who you ask, right? If, if you ask me, um, I, I, I think that probably more is needed. <laughs> Um, but for, for different reasons, I, I, I think, than, than other people would argue. Um, look, if you, if you sort of think about it in a mathematical equation, right, everybody's very focused on where revenue shook out for last year. And, um, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago, we saw some figures that revenues for state and local governments year over year were down about 5%. And then um, this afternoon, some, some more monthly figures came out, and we're really looking at a figure of like 1.8% decline year over year for revenues. And that's great. What no one's able to focus on, because the data is really not available right now, is really what the expense side of the ledger looks like. So while the mm -hmm. economy has looked more resilient than originally thought, because revenues aren't down as much as originally anticipated, expenses are up very, very big, especially when it comes to COVID mitigation and sort of dealing with the fallout of economic slowdown and closures. So I think that that's a very, very, very big headwind that a lot of local governments and state governments are dealing with as far as, you know, getting to a comfortable recovery period. So it did make me feel good to know that they were directing, again, some of this aid to um, states that have higher unemployment areas and, and recognizing that that, you know, getting to a fuller unemployment figure is key to an economic recovery and, and an economic recovery for, for everyone, right? Um, an equitable recovery. Um, I think it's great that they're sending money to schools. I mean, I'm on a local school board, so I'm, I'm ecstatic about that because the expenditures that we've seen for deep cleaning and, you know, PPE and, and things of that nature are really beyond what we even thought um, from a budgetary standpoint um, in the beginning of the pandemic. So it's, it's certainly very welcome. And I imagine a lot of school districts are, are feeling in a similar way especially not knowing what potential aid is going to look like if states have to cut back at all. So this really gives a lot of cushion um, so there doesn't have to be sort of these like downhill cuts going forward when states go through their budgetary process. What it additionally does um, is really sort of provides an, an, another extra cushion in case we do have a variant issue going forward and we have to sort of go into these like quasi, you know, um, lockdown periods again. So it, it sort of strengthens the balance sheet to withstand future economic turbulence, which is which is never a bad thing with so much uncertainty lying ahead. Do you think it's gonna? Do you think that it could factor into the amount of issuance that we see in the next year or two? And what I mean by that is because of the fact that there is uh, the potential for this 350 billion of aid. Do you think mm -hmm. that if there were entities that were on the fence? about issuing bonds uh, that they might feel more uh, inclined to do so? I think anyone not issuing debt right now, certainly not doing it because rates aren't attractive or the fact that they, they need to because they have a project that they, um, you know, that desperately needs to get done. I, I think that mm -hmm. any delay right now really has to do with just waiting to see what sort of stimulus money is coming in. And like we stated off in the beginning, you know, sort of what, what the benefit is from an infrastructure package to see if it's worth, you know, holding out to participate in um, with some sort of tax benefit or, or, or matching funds from the federal government. So, um, you know, I, I think that really is going to be the biggest impact on, on issuance and supply. Um, look, I mean, you know, obviously February is, is a pretty decent reinvestment month. So there's going to be, you know, more and more cash um, cooking for a home. Um, the visible supply looks pretty light right now, but, you know, over the next week, the, you know, there's another $3 billion in paper that's just not reflected in that number yet. So visible supply well, looks anemic right now on a chart. I, I think it looks worse than it actually is. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you, you work for an underwriter. How's your pipeline? Does it look full? Mm -hmm. um, you could tell me more than my seat at Bloomberg, sort of, you know, what the anticipation is for issuance over the next couple months. So it, it sounds as though that the sixth phase of the sixth stage of relief is going to be the 1.9 trillion or something close to the 1.9 trillion. You've mentioned a few times the potential for 
what would be, you know, a seventh phase and something focused on infrastructure. One of the things that we saw in the infrastructure uh, proposal from the House Democrats last year would be a, a redo or a revamp of a taxable Build America bond-like program. Do you think that there is going to be, uh, if, you know, if that happens, do you think that there would be a good amount of investor appetite for, for such a product? Well, look, I mean, a couple of things, right? So you referred to dishonest stimulus as like the sixth phase. I know it's being referred to as stimulus, but I, I sort of agree with the sentiment I saw last week where they said you have to look at the money being spent and proposed being spent the same as if we were in, in an actual war. And we wouldn't be thinking about it as stimulative. It would be going out and spending whatever money needs to be spent to win that war. So I think that's an appropriate way of looking at it, right? We're going into battle, and these, this is the war chest we're building up to fight that war against COVID, right? So that, that's sort of how I'm viewing this $1.9 trillion. Um, As far as infrastructure, I sort of look at that as separate and aside, right? This is a platform that um, now President Biden ran on. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been fits and starts and discussions about infrastructure, and it never went anywhere. All the while, um, you know, the, the figures from the American Association of Civil Engineers look worse and worse. So it's good that we're actually getting some, at, at least talk about doing something definitively. Um, and then you have a president who came out of an administration the last time we had a federal tax incentive bond program through BADS and, and ARA. So this is a playbook that he's quite familiar with. Um, you know, and also keep in mind that you have a bunch of senior administration officials who are pro muni market and familiar with the muni market as well. Um, you know, Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, uh, former mayor. So, you know, to think that municipal bonds are going to be part of the solution as far as an infrastructure package goes, I, I think it's a reasonable assumption. I don't know quite what it will look like. You know, obviously, um, you know, Issuers and, and buyers were, were not that thrilled uh, the last time when sequestration really started to come into effect. Um, so I feel like they they got something they weren't exactly anticipating. Um, so maybe they'll learn from the lessons of the past and trying to get a, a more perfect product out the door if they go down that road again. But look, as we've seen from um, the taxable space and the demand for taxable immunities over the past two years, it's a very, very real demand. Um, and the in investor universe exceeds the U.S. domestic borders. We have interest from Asian companies and European companies who want, um, you know, a, a low beta risk asset with, um, you know, a basically an uncorrelation to U.S. equity. And that's what they get in the municipal space. You know, one of the things that could very well happen uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say very well happen because at this point we're going on four, five plus trillion dollars of uh, fiscal relief coming out of Washington D.C. And it wasn't, it didn't take very long after the Great Recession for lawmakers in D.C. to start talking about deficit reduction. Mm -hmm. In 2010, the Simpson Bowles. Uh, group led a, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. They were seeking to reduce the deficit by $4 trillion. And the plan that they came out came up with eliminated several tax deductions and expenditures, including the municipal bond tax exemption tax expenditure. We saw a pretty high-level threat uh, at the end of 2017 during the, the the lead up to the tax cut during the negotiations, it was uh, thought that private activity bonds might be lost and advanced for funding with tax exempts was lost. What do you think? You know, do you think that this is something that's on the mind of, or, or sh even should be on the minds of investors or others uh, right now? Do you think that there is, uh, that it's time to be thinking about the threat to the tax exemption when interestingly, we're also looking at the prospect of maybe a situation where in another phase of relief or stimulus, there is, you know, they start bringing back uh, a taxable BAB-like program where maybe they do uh, reintroduce or, or reallow 
uh, advance your funding to tax exempts. What's your take on that? I mean, look, according to data from the Joint Committee on Taxation, the, the cost of actual to, for munis to issue um, is like 15 on the rank of federal expenditures. I mean, it's it's just not that much. Um, so I, I really would think that would be counterintuitive to them stimulating the economy on the local level, trying to create jobs, getting spending and, and sort of having a recovery narrative to take away the ability for state and local governments to issue tax exempt. And it end up being by proxy a, a tax raise on the local level. It just seems like they would sort of work in, in, in complete opposite impact of what they're trying to do. I understand, um, but you know, you're, you're referring to a time when we had an economic crisis with really a health crisis that we're dealing with now that has had economic impacts. I do view them very differently. Um, so, you know, I, I think for at least my mind right now, Look, I think you're definitely going to get Republican pushback from, uh, and you know, all these attempts by a Democratic administration to push through massive spending efforts. Of course, you're seeing that right now. There's, the, you know, obstruction um, being thrown up as far as some of the numbers being thrown around for the $1.9 trillion package. Um, but I, I have to think that they don't want to move two steps forward just to go one step back with taking away the tax exemption. But, I mean, it always comes up uh, when a new administration comes in. I mean, this is not this is nothing new. Um, but, you know, thankfully we're an industry with strong lobbying and we have a lot of smart people in uh, federal government uh, seats who understand our market. So it's, it's been, you know, good for us so far. You know, one of the things that I've, I've participated in and have seen uh, over the last 10 years is a lot, is there's been a, a strong educational process going on from organizations like the, the GFOA and the BDA to describe to lawmakers in DC uh, about the you know wh what the the what the value of the tax exemption is for state local governments and for for citizens throughout the country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eric, thank you very much. Those were the topics that uh, we wanted to cover. I think that that should uh, get everyone up to date on the things that are happening in the municipal bond market. Again, we want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, looking forward to having you come back and, and talk again. All right. Thanks, Tom. Sounds good.